All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. It is RCFB Talk 164. It is Tuesday night. This is when we like to talk to you about whatever is going on in college football that you want to talk about. Lots of exciting things going on. If you want to join us, you can always hit request from the Twitter app. Just hit that request button in the bottom left. We'll talk about what's going on in the day. So let's see here. I know my cohort, Andrew Sagona, is going to be joining us for a second. He was part of the teleconference after the latest CFP rankings came out. But as we kind of warm up, I just wanted to touch on a couple of topics that are going on right now. Quite literally, games. Because right now there's some exciting action going on in three different games. So right now we've got a tie ball game with, you know, again, I apologize. There might be a slight time delay on this, but with about less than 3.30 left in the fourth quarter, we got Ball State and NIU tied at 17 apiece on CBS SN. We have the rivalry game with Central Michigan leading 28-21 over Western Michigan, and they have exchanged leads there after an incredible 21-point third quarter by the Chips. So they are now in the fourth quarter with about 10 and 20 left in the game. And Ohio and Buffalo are tied at 10 apiece on ESPN2, also in the fourth quarter. So got to love Maction. Maction is magic. They are having some fun all across the board right now. Lots of things going on, but I just really wanted to quickly kick off with Andrew. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing very well, sir. How are you doing? Good. So, you know, we are in the second week of the college football playoff rankings. And just as a quick rundown for those who might have missed it, pretty much the top eight are the same. We have the five undefeated teams, Ohio State, Georgia, Michigan, Florida State, and Washington in that order. Followed by, again, the one-loss teams, at least the top three one-loss teams have not budged. We have Oregon, Texas, and Alabama. With Oklahoma's loss, Ole Miss and Penn State and Louisville just all moved up one. And then uh, we have a little bit of, and probably Mizzou's loss as well, of course, although Mizzou did not move down quite as far because they put up, I think, a decent game against Georgia. And then again, we've got uh, beyond that, it was interesting to see Oregon State as the top number two team after LSU's loss. But all of that said, you know, I, I know you had a chance to get in a question and talk to Boo Corrigan. What, what was the conversation that you two had, or at least what was the topic that you had an opportunity to ask him about? Sure. Well, when I asked, when I was watching the, the ranking show, the thing that immediately jumped out to me was Iowa jumping to lane. They were unranked. Uh, their offense has sucked, to put it mildly. And they've had all these close games, and they have two losses. So how they were able to jump to Lane, whose only loss was Ole Miss, just was beyond me. So I initially wanted to just – I wanted to ask that question. How did Iowa jump to Lane? But with some helpful calling down and editing with uh, Bob back here, I came up with the question of, and I'm going to read it verbatim just so I don't say anything wrong. Uh, where did I put, where is it? Oh, wait, it's in the chat. I'll grab it really quick. Well, no, no, yeah, you, you, your question that came in regards to the ranking of Iowa. That's how you phrase it. They were, uh, right. I, got to tell, I, I love it. They give us the, uh, those of us who are on the culture bullets, list, they give us the, uh, the transcript. They were unranked last week and they have had, to put it mildly, very low scoring games this entire season, including a last second win over below 500 Northwestern in that incredible game. At, I'm, I'm just side piece, an incredible uh, game at Wrigley Field. Incredible for not necessarily the right reasons. What justified the committee's <laughs> eyes on such a high jump from unranked to, I believe it was 22nd in the rankings? And yeah, he, it's so funny. His answer was fascinating because he said they were strong in two of the three facets of the game. And that was good enough, you know, to, to move them up to that 22nd ranking. You know, quite honestly, and I know an earlier time, an earlier question, he did uh, somewhat talk about Tulane. And I think he, because the question was about such a close loss, or pardon me, pardon me, close win against a miserable East Carolina team. And I think they considered that as well. You know, one thing I would caution, especially when we're looking at the, uh, the P5 teams in the rankings, especially now that they could squeeze one more in because uh, Air Force lost and they could quietly kind of usher them out of the rankings. Uh, it's an opportunity, especially once you get, I think, in the lower half 
of the rankings to legitimize the teams above them. And I think Iowa being there gives an opportunity to kind of give the the Big Ten a little more cachet, particularly, you know, it benefits Penn State to some extent. I always say, like, who benefits? Like, <laughs> not to be cynical, but you always kind of have to look at that. I, I predicted last week that and I know we didn't have a show last week, but I, I've been doing this other this other podcast with Shehan Jayaraj of CBS Sports, where we kind of talk about um, playoffs. And I th- I was predicted that Arizona would be the first school to to be ranked with three losses, and they were, and they're they're not the only one, but they're currently the uh, well Notre Dame has Notre Dame and LSU have a little edge on them, but at this point they are on a winning streak, three ranked wins, and they benefit several other teams from the Pac-12 by including them in that ranking. So you kind of have to look at it that way. And that's not to take anything against from the the Wildcats. I, it's been exciting to watch them now that they have a quarterback. Um, you know, I want to go ahead and also let up a couple of other people who've been waiting. Let's see. Let's go ahead and start up with Techno Sinister. I saw him requesting quickest. And I also saw uh, John Reese. We'll get to you guys as well. If you'd like to join the conversation, you can always hit request. It's fun talking about all aspects of college football. We can talk playoff. We can talk. Gosh, anything. Lots of lots of interesting stuff to go uh, to go off on or whatever, you know. So what's going on? Let's see here. Techno Sinister, what's on your mind? Oh, hey, Rock Chalk Jayhawk. Uh, I just want to say feels good to have a seven-win season for the first time since I was eight years old. <laughs> oh, my gosh. These always make me feel so old when people say that. Uh, but, yeah, it's been a while. It has been a while, and wow. Kansas has been an absolute delight. And they're yeah. staying in the top 25. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, you I'm know, it's so not like happy. it's a flash in the pan. Everyone said we were going to lose that Iowa State game, and they almost did because they fell apart at the end. But uh, Bean pulled it off. Uh, High Shaw pulled it off. Well, and um, uh, Melo Dotson pulled it off with two pick sixes in a row, except he got injured, so hopefully he's okay. But I'm wearing my Jason Bean jersey right now. I'm riding with Bean. I think he's going to get us to at least a nine-win season. So, yeah, Rock Shock, Jayhawk, and Muck Fazoo. Yeah, it's a plausible – and, again, the rest of the season is really – it's almost like – and I don't want to take away from K-State. I think K-State's going to be the toughest game of the remaining three, but that's a rivalry game, and it's in yeah. Lawrence. So that's good. I'll be but there. Texas Tech has been a bit disappointing, and Cincinnati's <laughs> really been disappointing. So, I mean, it's it's plausible. you got three games left. I think – Winning out would not be, un, I mean, I, it's, it's, isn't it interesting? I mean, we're talking about Kansas, and it seems plausible that they could, they could win out for the rest of the season. And as a regular season team, have 10 wins. That, that's, that's, you know, an incredible statement for, for Lance Leipold and, and the work he's done there. The best part is we probably, uh, well, not the best part. The weirdest part is we won't even, probably won't even make the Big 12 <laughs> playoffs because it's, like now it's like a it's a gauntlet now because it's Oklahoma State, Texas. Uh, we would have to well yeah we would have to get tiebreaker with a K State and then uh, yeah win out and then Oklahoma State would have to I don't it's really complicated. It is you know but I it's it's wild that that could even be a, a, I mean I agree a lot of things would have to happen for the Jayhawks to get that chance but you know what it's crazy that that could even be a theoretical possibility and yeah I've been I, okay I'm gonna admit I've been really big I pulled. Fan because at RCFB were we like all levels of college football, and I was watching. I was absolutely fascinated by that decade where it was the weirdest duopoly in any division of sports, where it was either Mount Union or Wisconsin Whitewater. Mount Union, Wisconsin Whitewater, like taking up, I believe it was like eleven of twelve national championships at the D three level. So I was very familiar yeah. with him as a coach, and I remember when Buffalo hired him, I'm like, that's a, that's a really bold move. And then yeah, when the Jayhawks had him, I was like. If he's half as good as he seemed at that lower division, he's going to know how to coach guys and, and make them ready to compete. And, wow, it's, it's actually, I'll be honest, it's better than I expected. I didn't necessarily expect he would, he would do this kind of work, but, wow, it's, it's I, yeah. As a KU fan, I didn't expect this at all, honestly. Um, that WVU game last year really shocked me, like that game where we – I mean, we took it to overtime and we won with a pick six. It was insane. I was not expecting that. I was expecting us to get blown out in that game because, I mean, well, yeah, we beat Texas the year prior, but it was like, I don't think we're going to be that good. I mean, we were used to beating Texas during crap years anyway, so it's like that doesn't mean anything. But uh, it's like I didn't think we – I think we would be bad 
forever. I never saw this coming, honestly. So I, I can't be any happier. I'm so happy. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, thanks for joining us. It's, it's good to talk to fans who are having a good season. You know, it's sometimes we get dreary season. Sometimes we'll talk to folks who, who are totally expecting nothing and then their seasons turn out well. But I mean, again, Kansas is on the rise and it's great to see it. And I, I hope Leipold stays there because it's it's fun to see variety, quite frankly. And with the 12-team playoff coming, you know, next season, a lot of these teams that might have always been kind of like, well, we always have to worry about team A or B, you know, dominating the conference. You know what? You don't necessarily have to be that to challenge them completely to, to get your spot in the playoff and maybe, you know, finish up even stronger. Because I've seen those teams. You know, we've all seen those teams where it's like they took a couple of lumps Early in the season, they finish off super strong, and no one wants to play them by the end of the season. Um, actually, before Pete Carroll really got the Trojans rolling, that was kind of where – actually, even when he was at his peak, that was sort of where they were, especially in the BCS era where one loss more or less sunk your, uh, sunk your program. By the end of the season, people are like, okay, he's figured it out. I mean, in the BCS era, Alabama right now would have been kind of a, well, I'm not sure they have a shot. They already lost to Texas. And I don't know anyone who wants to play Alabama right now. I mean, they are a terrifying program, it's, especially with what we saw against LSU and what Milrow kind of, you know, allowed to be Milrow unleashed. What we saw that that was that was something else. But um, yeah, man, thanks for joining us. You know, John, I'm going to let you up, uh, and then I'll I'll try to get to to everyone here um, who wants to talk. It's always great to talk to you on Tuesday nights. I'm Bob Akhairi. It's our CFB Talk 164. John, what's going on? Hey, man, how you been? I'm good. I'm good. Man, I have not been good. Um, as a uh, ODU and both an Atlanta Falcons fan, uh, this past weekend really made me question my love for football a lot. <laughs> it was, it was, a, it was a, definitely a rough two days in a row. But, you know, I definitely – and, you know, I, I missed our talk last week too because I had a great Halloween joke for you and everything. Um, oh, did you? Well, wait, it's not too oh, late. You can well, share I was, was going to tell you how I, was, I uh, dressed up as a motorcycle to scare Bobby Petrino and Bobby Petrino only this past Halloween. Um, but, um, so my main, uh, main question or, or more rant for tonight is about, you know, G5 teams in general in the college football playoff rankings. Uh, you know, last week we, the first rankings came out and, you know, Tulane and Air Force are given a, you know, a ranking I feel is just, I, I, I don't I hate to use the word disrespectful, but if you, as a G5 fan, it feels disrespectful. You know, I know Air Force lost last weekend. I understand that, you know, Tulane. You know, you know, in all the situations, but I feel like with their resumes and what the performance they were doing up to that point, they should have been ranked higher. And it just it gets frustrating as a G five fan when you see when you see those rankings. You know, you even question if the twelve team playoff is even realistic for a, a G five team at this point. And, you know, it's tough when you know when you have the ACCs or you know telling their teams not to schedule Sun Belt teams. Um, but it's, it feels like you know there's such a huge gap, and I'm just trying to figure out. What we what can even be done at this point to even give you know give you know you know these good G five teams even a realistic chance of being into the playoffs? You know this is I think overall been an interesting year for the G five. They haven't had a real, frankly, for all of college football. When you think about it, we don't have at necessarily the P five level a runaway team where everyone's like, well, they're going to probably just win through and win it all. There's at least five candidates, frankly six, because I think some of the one loss teams actually seven now that I think about it, that I think really have a reasonable shot. Um, and likewise, the G5, James Madison's in that weird zone. The, the committee said they will rank them if the NCAA grants a waiver and they can become bowl eligible. That was what I gleaned from the conversation, especially in the questions that were asked in the uh, to Boo Corrigan in the Q&A tonight. But setting them aside, you know, Liberty, Liberty's problem is their schedule is absolute hot garbage. And, I mean, they've been playing games close. Um, I remember I'm a big fan of reading Phil Steele's preseason mag, and they had the 133rd out of 133rd FBS schedule. So that Liberty going undefeated, that's, that was going to be their doom. and That was going to always keep them back. Tulane losing that one close game without Pratt, their star quarterback, to Ole Miss. That gives them, I think, an edge, and they're, they're one loss, and that's why I think they're in there. But it, I do admit, seeing it where they were ranked, especially in week one of the college football playoff, pardon me, uh, with um, the 24th and the Air Force the 25th, it just kind of felt like, oh, crap, we got to fit these guys in somewhere. Like, <laughs> we got we to gotta make the G5 fans happy. It didn't feel like 
the year where we saw against Cincy or, or, or historically with some of the stronger G5 teams. And, and part of me wonders, is it because they're a little down? UTSA, a lot of people had hopes for them. And they fell out, they ran out flat, you know, in the early preseason. So probably the early season stuff in their non-conference schedule. Um, so that's kind of, I think, been somewhat damaging for them overall. Fresno State, I'd be curious to see if they have been ranked higher. UNLV is also an interesting one. Um, those two guys, you know, those two teams out there have been, I think, more impressive than usual. But again, it's it's a tough, it's a tough year for that. And I think part of it is how uncertain it is at the P5 because there's so many teams kind of crowding in there because a lot of folks will tell you, you could, you could jumble around a lot of these tiers and still come up with a reasonable reason for ranking these teams the way they are, especially with the no loss and one loss teams. Um, it's tough. It's really tough to rank them right now. It, it's, I think it's tougher than previous years. Um, but as far as the G5, this is a down year, I think, for the G5 overall, especially with so many of the the preseason favorites taking losses so fast. Um, and this is going to be one of those years where I think at this point, Tulane's in the driver's seat if they can win out. But uh, I guess if, if they trip up, I mean, it might open up space for a Mountain West team to climb up. But we'll see. We'll see about that. Let's see here. You know, else? Oh, go ahead, John. Yeah, I just, I, it's just, it's just frustrating. You know, it's just that's. I think that's the main point I was just trying to make. You know, it's just it, it, it feels like you know, it's, yeah, it just feels like there's there's a gap, you know, between both team, uh, you know, just between the two thing, uh, um, areas, and especially you well know, with all the realignment, it makes you question how, how big the gap really is right now. That, but it's just too soon to really see, you know, the the you know strengths of conferences versus each other with all the realignment. Well, one of the more awkward, one of the more awkward things to see this year are the new <laughs> Big Twelve arrivals and how they've been kind of because I mean, there's lots of interpretations for why you know again, uh, Houston, BYU, UCF, um, they're all kind of struggling a bit there. And uh, one of the thing, and Cincinnati, and one of the things has been one of the more compelling arguments is how long it takes to build a roster that has the depth that can compete, you know, week in and week out, and. Perhaps that's what we're seeing. Um, certainly, it, it hasn't been a very auspicious. And and to be fair, I, I think to some extent, I felt since it kind of got a little bit hosed with suddenly a changing in the coaching um, right before they, they came over. That was a bit of a surprise there. Reese, what's on your mind? Hey, uh, first of all, as a fellow Monarchs fan, we are all suffering. I don't know what the hell this team's doing this year. Um, <clears throat> except for blowing leads in the fourth quarter. You know, of course. Um Bobak, I have a question for you. Surely. Um, I need some crowd participation for this one. I have I have some stuff for you. All right. Um, I'm currently writing an article coming out tomorrow on James Madison and the disrespect they're getting. Funny you should say it earlier. I have some numbers for you, and I would like for the crowd here to give the heart emote. If you did not know these stats. Can we can we do this real quick? Sure, sure, sure. Are these from the talking points that they sent out today? No, actually, I did not see those. Okay. Um, this is from my own research for an article coming out tomorrow. I've been working on all day, right? So what I need you to do for me is I'm going to open up another window. If you can tell me how many reactions we get, that'd be great. Because I'm going to assume most of America does not know these stats because the NCAA is not counting GMU stats on their website. All right? Yeah, shoot. Okay. James Masson's Jalen Green is the nation's leading sacker with 3.5 more sacks than the person in second place. Right? He also has the most tackles for loss in the country, three ahead of Old Dominion's Jason Henderson, who might be one of the best defensive players in the country, by the way. JMU as a team has 42 sacks. That's the most in the country. Uh, D'Angelo Pons their leading uh, cornerback has 12 passes defended. That's the third most in the FBS. But James Masson's stats aren't being counted. Michael Kamara has three forced fumbles this year. That would be tied for sixth in the FBS, right? Quarterback Jacob McC uh, Jordan McLeod. Right, 2,330 yards this year. That's 30th, tied with Haynes King, who we all think is a halfway decent quarterback. Uh, receiver Reggie Brown is tied for 34th in the FBS. 
in receiving yards this year, right? So those are a few of the key points. I'm not going to give out the whole thing because the article comes out more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Read it. You know, one of the things can, that, that's really read. a pain and makes me really sad is Jalen Green. You're right. He's absolutely <laughs> tremendous. And unfortunately, he's missing the rest of the season. He got injured this past weekend yes. and, the, yes. and he's out for the, and the, the sad thing was again as you pointed out the ncaa this part i really don't like it's one thing to say okay you're not bowl eligible you can't play in the postseason and they're appealing that mm -hmm. but they weren't including any of their stats so nope. jalen green who's had an incredible season and, and again we hope he recovers and can play more uh down the line but again yeah he had an incredible you know 50 mm -hmm. total tackles 21 for a loss 15.5 sacks it picks six, you know, it's, it's absolutely nuts how that guy is playing. He was one play. sack away from JMU's single season record. But I, I just want to say this, you know, we have the transfer portal. Everyone's using it. That rule is so antiquated. It's not even funny. You know, and JMU had no problem getting to the scholarship requirements. They have no problem being competitive. Um, they have a better resume than Oklahoma state does. My SEO, you win. They're and a top if 15 I, team. If, if I recall, they also played a full FBS uh, schedule their first yeah, year. Yeah, they did. They went like eight that. and three. They went eight and three. And yeah, they, they beat, are the uh, top 25 team, the Coastal Carolina. Yeah, they ha they've played the most FBS opponents <laughs> of any year one mm -hmm. school uh, and accumulated the most FBS wins of any mm -hmm. year one school. I mean, so, we don't hold we don't hold Alabama's you know FCS opponent against them, do we? No, but I, again, I, I, and I agree, it's an antiquated rule. And it, it's been fascinating. This kind of builds into what, for those who may not be familiar, what's been going on today is JMU has sent out a um, 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 letter, official letter, to the NCAA's board of directors to, mm -hmm. to ask for this to be removed. It sounds like the attorney general of the state of Virginia may yeah, yeah. back them in pushing this. And it's actually kind of fascinating, too, because there's already been some and of course, the Sun Belt has also sent a letter to the. Mm -hmm. uh, the it, it's it's a it's um a collective move to try and change things for JMU. But one of the things, and I noticed a, a message, pardon me, a tweet earlier today from Brian Fisher, the reporter. You know, I am told that reclassification is going to be a topic of discussion at the NCA convention in January. Now, that's not something that's obviously going to benefit this season. And what that brings up is how to change NCA classification and not necessarily penalize all teams. Mm -hmm. There's some chatter apparently about creating certain levels of benchmarks where a team like a JMU, because JMU, and, and we've talked to their, uh, their soon to retire uh, athletic director on an uh, RCFB talk uh, last season. Uh, they had a very, a very organized, very deliberate move to FBS. In fact, they mm -hmm. were kind of a, uh, there were people who had, I, pardon me, there were conferences that had approached them for joining in the past several years, and they just said, we're going to wait. Because when they wanted to join, they wanted to join and hit the ground running, and clearly they did. Uh, and they did last season, and they absolutely have this mm -hmm. season. Well, But it's, yeah. it's it, at least in some way they're getting the change, mm -hmm. but I, I don't know. It's, it's interesting to watch. Well, we get so mad when the NCAA punishes student-athletes for things that happened years ago, but we don't get mad about this. Like this is this is. I think there's a athletes. fair amount of there is a okay. fair amount of that. I mean, yeah, I've seen some editorial media. comments from guys like like real top national reporters, like again, like Bruce Feldman, uh, you know, uh, uh, Brett McMurphy, at all. You know, you know, you can look at a lot of the people who talk about it. I mean, uh -huh. it, it is a derided rule, and hopefully, we see some change on it. And I mean, I'm glad. To see that movement again, things move slow, unfortunately, in a lot of this stuff. But I'm hoping, I'm hoping this pressure because again, the NCAA knows that they're losing in courts repeatedly now. They they are the hunted, and they are quite, I think, acutely aware of it. And I think they know there's some hills that are not worth dying on, um, especially with some of the other bigger issues they're dealing with. I could see them with enough pressure especially if they start to get like a lawsuit involved in the state of Virginia being sued by the state of Virginia. I could see them backing down on it. I wouldn't be shocked because, again, the NCAA, they've got bigger fish to fry right now. And, and getting into a big fight, especially in a, in a, a populous state over, you know, <laughs> over bowl eligibility might not be it. And you know who would also benefit from it? If I'm Jacksonville State, I'm just sitting in the yep. background like, go, go, go. Because Jacksonville State's also basically has able to reach the, uh, the bowl qualification they can't. 
Um, so that would bring that would bring those Gamecocks into it. They gave they gave the other Gamecocks quite a run. They did uh, last I, Saturday. I have a few more things also. Um, oh, you know, I, Reese, can we get back to you in a second? I just want to allow a couple of other people a sure. chance. Because uh, um, I want to allow folks who who've been waiting patiently, and I'm going to go yeah, to Iman, um, Ronnie J, and Ski Mask Smurfy. I see you guys out there. Um, let's see here. All right, let's see here. We have <laughs> Raven sponsor, uh, Iman, enraged Maryland sports fan. I can't wait. So feel free to unmute yourself. I'd love to hear from you. Well, I've got two very. Good- I've got obviously a mixed bag right now. I was the guy who talked about, you know, my high hopes for Maryland in the beginning of the year. Obviously, I got the 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 Ravens on one side who look like one of the best teams in the NFL and their defense is amazing. And then I got I I'm just going to say it right now. Fire Mike Lock- Locksley. I'm done. I'm done. I've given him so much of a leash, but this team for a guy who 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 we got for who can recruit he can't recruit. He, he really can't. And, and, and this is the most talented Maryland team in a long time. And there just seems to be something mentally off about them. They, they just, they hit the second, second part of the year in, in what the millionth year in a row. And they do this. I don't, I don't know what the problem is. I really don't. It, it just seems to be a mental block about winning. And when you hit November, uh, it is an absolutely remarkable thing, and I agree with you, and I sympathize because we all like to. It's like Iowa fans are tired. We're tired of hearing about all the jokes about their offense because it's like, look, we we know we they we know it became such a distraction when they fired it. But with Maryland, it's tiresome to hear like, oh, it's September Maryland, which luckily September was five weeks, uh, five weekends this year, and then we get. I mean, literally, it's so funny. You watch the light flip, and then the moment the calendar turned to October, four losses in a row. Um, and that's not great that, and, and again, James Franklin really hates, uh, Maryland apparently because he suddenly we watched a competent Nittany Lions offense, um, you know, this past weekend. And I sympathize because I don't know what, I don't know what the fix is. And it's always been tough. You know, you always feel like Maryland's a team that is, you know, they're not going to necessarily replace the the top tier no, 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 of the yeah. uh, of the Big Ten, but they're going to be a team you want exactly like a, t- a year like this where they seem really talented and they're putting up. I a lot just of want points. something. I just yeah. want something. <laughs> I, I feel you. I feel you. It's tough for Terps fans, and and again, I know this has got to be just painful to watch. It's like not again. I think to some extent I, there's some commiseration with the folks at Syracuse too because they they seem to start out strong, get ranked. And then implode. It's like you could say it's like clockwork for those two teams in the last few seasons. And yeah, and I and I and I changed my bio because honestly, like I I talk to these writers from Maryland and and they don't seem to get it. They're like, you know, why do people never show up? Because they've done the same thing this many years in a row when the calendar hits October. It's literally (laughs) happened time and time again. And people are wondering why they don't go to the games. It's not a surprise. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I sympathize, man. Thanks for joining us. I really appreciate it. Hey, Andrew, just as we kind of transition, I wanted to quickly ask you, I'm going to let you up, Ronnie J. What is, what are the scores we're looking at right now? Sure. So in the central Michigan, Western Michigan game, uh, the score is 38 to 25 in favor of the Broncos with 311 left in the fourth. They are currently at the CMU 14, second and eight. Uh, going over to New York, uh, the Ohio Bobcats are up on the Buffalo Bulls, 20 to 10, with 155 left in the fourth. But Buffalo does have the ball, so but they are deep in their territory. Also, we have gone final in uh, Northern Illinois Ball State. Ball State squeaks out a 2017 victory over the Huskies and take the bronze stock trophy. So uh, we're almost done with matching for Tuesday, but so far a lot of close games. Yeah, I, I didn't realize that last one was a rivalry game. I knew CMU Western Michigan was, but that's exciting. Good. Well, good for Ball State. You know, uh, ball so hard out there. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to seeing you know again. They're, 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 I love Maction. It's fun. It's chaos. They're 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 always they're always entertaining. Um, so let's see, Ronnie State, Day, what's the going home on, of man? The, I was going to say Dave, the fighting David Letterman's of Ball State. Yeah. So Ronnie J, what's going on? What's on your mind? 
Yo, I like up, Jim guys? Davis, by the way. Jim Davis is my my Ball State alum. I just got to say, because I grew up with Garfield in the 80s when he was at his peak. Jim Davis, man. <laughs> he actually taught art at Ball State. Can you imagine taking a uh, class from the guy who wrote who drew Garfield? I don't know. That's just me. But Ronnie J, what's going on, man? What's going on? Uh, so uh, I, I want to say, did you, did you hear Rutgers got a shot, shout out in the college football playoff You know, I, I love the fact that, you know, well, first of all, those who may not be familiar and not paying attention to the Michigan stuff with all the, the uh, Connor Stallions, the um, the Connor Stan- Stallions universe. I almost feel like he's like the Darth Vader now of of this whole big story. Like, where did he go? Who did he, you know, what teams did he touch? Like all of this, this spying stuff and, and, and scouting stuff, to be honest, is is based off of his, you know, what he did. But, you know, th- th- that's the story today. You know, uh, one of the stories today that... Um, Michigan has reported that uh, some of the teams had, uh, I guess, given Purdue Michigan signs before the the conference title game, uh, you know, and uh, they blamed Ohio State and they blamed Rutgers. So yeah, Rutgers mentioned. And to me, I'm like, doesn't that it, I, it would be hilarious. It's like, oh, wait, oh, we can blame Rutgers. You know, forget Michigan, forget Ohio State. It all goes down to those, you know, those Tony Soprano types. In Rutgers, they're the ones that are pulling the string. I mean, I'm, I'm saying this obviously jokingly, but wouldn't that be funny? It would be like, you know, it's like the joke is, you know, oh, someone violated rules. Let's just beat up Mizzou. Well, wouldn't that be perfect if that's Rutgers? Like, of course, the tentacles of those, you know, the Rutgers fans, they're, they're everywhere. It's it's all it's all going back to New Jersey, you know, but hey, we are yeah. the most corrupt state. Let's go. We did it. You but, know, don't uh, be- Exactly. If you're going to do something, be the best. That's what I say. I grew up in Bakersfield. Exactly. All right. So whenever there's like a list of the worst cities in America, I feel disappointed when Bakersfield isn't at the bottom or, you know, or at the top or however you want to say it. Like carjackings, you know, car, you know, worst air. We've been the worst air forever. At that point, you're all just living in our, you know, you, you, Bakersfield exists and the rest of you are competing for second. But, you know, things like worst place to, to grow up, raise a family, worst place to, to be a woman was rankings where they were worse you know like again like if you're gonna be if you're gonna do something be the best at it in new jersey i love a, the most corrupt good for you i love a good old-fashioned race to the bottom you know yeah absolutely it's, it's but, you know rutgers is not racist spot we're talking about football that was, that was the old rutgers this rutgers hey, now back, put back, up a fight. back to 2007 let's go if i wanted to talk what? about USC, not Rutgers today, because Rutgers, the game was whatever. It was, it was, the game went the way hey, everyone thought before, it would Before go. we get off Rutgers, I just want to say one thing. Boo Corrigan tonight, when he was talking about why they kept Ohio State above Georgia, he was going off about Rutgers being a top 20 defense and how Ohio State put those points on them. So yeah, it's, uh, to me, I read that even though it was kind of like a side story. I'm like, we are in a world where the college football playoff committee is using the fact that you know, uh, on, you know, the Ohio State offense, because obviously there was a defensive touchdown, but the Ohio State offense put up 35 points and 28 offensive points on Rutgers as a like benchmark. Like, when did Rutgers? I mean, and I'm not saying that, and I mean that that's a good sign that uh, you know, Shiano, you've made yeah. yourself a uh, uh, at least a supporting character in in all of this, and that that's way better than where Rutgers was before. Oh yeah, no, it's 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 fantastic. I, I love. But let's go to time. USC. Let's talk USC. Yeah, USC, man, they are such a disaster, and it is fantastic. You guys have no clue how excited I am for USC versus Oklahoma in the famous Idaho Potato Bowl. <laughs> it's gonna I be think it might be the Alamo Bowl, but yeah, the famous Idaho Potato Bowl would be even funnier, like watching some them play just, on the blue turf. <laughs> it's just some dumb bowl that no one actually cares about, you know? It's going to be great. But, oh, and it's going to uh, be funny because no one else will care about it, but Mike, goodness or is that going to be a hostile like oh, i am not like be from the most pure, like we are at it, i would not want to moderate that particular game threat because the oklahoma fans really don't like usc because of the whole lincoln riley thing and so oh my goodness that is going to be pure drama i hope they end up in a bowl against each other because that will be absolutely dynamite i mean i think it's going to actually end up being a minor bowl that'll have a high spike in the number of views just because people will want to watch that train wreck oh, um, exactly but you know, so, think, so by the way, so we should thank you, Oklahoma State. Thank you for for making sure Oklahoma probably will not have any shot at reaching the Big Twelve title game. Oh yeah, no, that's great. It's, it is, it is going to be fantastic content. 
when they when somehow the NCAA and the bowl organizers force this matchup to happen. It's going to be great. But I'm trying to think, is there any player who's hurt like their stock or capital as much this year as Caleb Williams has? You know, I'm going to say this First much, of all, as much as, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Go like, ahead. He said he wasn't going to go to a team if he didn't like them. He'll just stay for another year, which that's kind of like, at the time I was like, ah, whatever, like, you know, he's, he's just saying that if he's going to be the first pick, he's going to go overall. He's going to go. Then he was doing the, uh, there was a rumors that his con- in his contract negotiations, he wants to has like a partial ownership, which the NFL stepped in and said, no, Aaron Rodgers can't even get that. We're not allowing that. And then after that, this is going to sound maybe a little mean, but when he was crying with and hugging his mom, that in itself wasn't the issue. The issue was he blasted uh, Dugan for that last year. He blasted him for that last year after they lost in the Big 12 championship game at TCU. So it's just like, I feel like he's just done nothing, no favors for himself this year. He's, he, he's done nothing. He's, I think he's having a worse year than last year, I guess. The team's not in a good place. And just publicly, he's just hurting his own image. You know, it's interesting because I agree overall, especially uh, heading into this week, uh, this past weekend, I should say. I think he definitely heard it. He definitely was in the worst place as far as attractive and being attractive to the uh, uh, NFL and all of that stuff. I think it's interesting. I was curious to see what the how it would be viewed. And again, how scouts and the NFL teams view it versus how sports media view it or, or can be different things because obviously then we'll see how they do in the, uh, cause that's the thing. One thing, eventually you get to like the, uh, the, uh, the combine and suddenly we get totally different views on a lot of quarterbacks, but, but to Caleb Williams, you know, seeing him run over and then for those who missed it at the end of that game, cause it was, it was kind of an, you know, that was a game where Caleb Williams wasn't the problem for USC. It was the old Alex Grinch defense. And of course they let him go after the game, oh. but, but I mean, you know, watching him run up to the, to the sideline, probably run up to the side of the stadium, jump up, jump to his mom and his mom kind of, you know, covered up with a big kind of placard. To, so people couldn't see him crying, but it was obviously was because you could see his body kind of doing that light convulsing that people do when they sob. And it was interesting too, because I've seen a lot of, I was interested to hear a lot of feedback from a lot of the other kind of sports writers that it was like, well, most people kind of drew back to some that oh, I forgot who said it, but it was like, oh, he should just quit now. He should just leave and not play another game and preserve his draft stock and just prepare for the draft. And people were like, you know, that was roundly people were like what, you know, these guys are spending their whole lives preparing to play like this and lead their team. And that's that was kind of one of those moments where you're like, reminded that these are still kids that love the game and love playing it and get hurt just as much when they lose as uh, as you'd expect they would for how much they love the game. And, and I agree. I think some of this stuff is hurt. I'm curious to see how he finishes the season now at this point, but he's he's playing. Obviously, Pac, the U.S. is totally out of any chance of anything other than being a spoiler and maybe, you know, I don't even know if they have any shot at making the Pac-12 championship at this point. Who are they, who can they even spoil? On Like, looking at their schedule, Washington's done, so they can't spoil them. Oregon already has a loss, so they're probably not in, they're probably not in any hunt for anything right now. Oh, no, I, I think Oregon, was- Oregon, if Oregon wins out, they're going to be, I think, realistically have an interesting shot because uh, the three teams that seem at least with one loss that if they win out, it would be really hard. It would be a hard question for the the um, committee to let them out are Oregon, Alabama and Texas. If, if those three teams went out, first of all, it'll two of them will have knocked off, you know, another undefeated team, but they will uh, or at least or at least one of them will have. They will um, they will really put a question mark into whether or not they should be in the playoff or not. The others need help like. Penn State needs Oregon, a lot of help. Does Oregon, does Oregon have a path to the championship game? If right they now? went out, it's going to be tough because they're going to have won a rematch with Wash, presumably Washington, in the Pac-12 no, title game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that would yeah. be that would help them a lot because then their only loss would have been a game where it was extremely close. It was at Washington. Some argued that Oregon played better in that game where they lost. It just you know, do the way it is. Somebody had to win that game, and then since that game. Oregon's looked, I mean, I think definitely Oregon's looked better than Washington. I actually had a discussion with another person who wanted to rank Washington behind Oregon. And I'm like, that feels weird. That just doesn't feel right. Sit right with me. But I could see the argument because of the two teams. I mean, look what Washington's done since then. I mean, and and that's the thing, like Washington, 
survived USC. And I mean, that defense of Washington almost looked as bad as the defense of USC. So that was that was kind of a problem there. I personally, I think the funny thing to do would be to send Alex if, if you really wanted to punish Michigan, send Alex Grinch and Brian Ferentz to be their their two new offensive and defensive coordinators. If you really if you wanted to violate the Geneva Convention and the Eighth Amendment of the US Constitution, you put those two guys that's Michigan's punishment for the rest of the season. You have to use those two as your, as your, uh, uh, <laughs> coordinators. Be, uh, honestly. Oh man, I would actually love that. That would be such a great, if they had the power to do that, that would be fantastic. <laughs> but, uh, Hey, you know, Iman, I know you wanted to add something. Yeah. I just have a different view on the Caleb Williams thing. And, and I just, just because, you know, being a Ravens fan, you know, Lamar Jackson's my quarterback. And my view on, on Caleb Williams is I, I think that the some of the stuff that people have – I've seen some awful stuff said about him, and frankly, I don't really understand it. Like the stuff about him wanting to own a team, the, there is absolutely no evidence that any of those stories had any validity to them at all. And I think that I, I, the thing about him showing emotion, like I, 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 I honestly – I don't get the hate at all because, frankly, let's be honest, USC's defense is one of the worst in the country. If they were even, like, remotely up to par, we wouldn't be talking about how bad USC is, and that's a fact. Caleb? I don't, the, issue isn't, the issue isn't that he showed emotion. That is 100% fine. At the end of the day, he's still a kid. He's 20, what, 20 years old at 21 years old probably? He's 21, yeah. I, I, yeah. He's 21 years old. He's a I kid. Just, the issue is that – he made fun of Max Dugan on Twitter last year, and then he does it. Okay, so what, what's what, like, why are you attacking him when he was in the same exact position that you're in now? Do you like, do you, like that's the problem. It just shows that he's immature more than anything else. You, that, well, he that, was what, 20 last year? So I, I think that's part of the thing. And you're trash talking uh, a guy who you're probably going to see in the, and he did in the, a Heisman, you know, ceremony. And, and clearly, I think to some extent, I think part of it is also just sort of, the classic mistake of not thinking about what you might tease someone even in a text or a group text where you're all kind of like, you know, razzing each other because of football players. God knows they've heard worse from, uh, <laughs> from yeah. especially from the defensive players who are getting ready to rush at them. But, uh, you know, uh, I think some of that is, is interesting. I'm, I'm curious to see how this plays out. I think he's, his draft stock is still pretty decent, but I think certainly it's, it's allowed room for more questions of who's going to be QB one and QB two. Um, but yeah. I think his, his talent will keep him in there. And I think we'll see. I'm very curious to see how the rest of his story plays out. And, and not just because, you know, I, I admittedly am a USC alumnus, but just because I'm curious to see also, frankly, how USC. I mean, I, I'm going to joke my joke and I'm 100 percent joking here. It would be hilarious if suddenly the USC defense started shutting on exp- shutting teams out. Like <laughs> that would be the most hilarious like result only for the sake of watching Alex Grinch leave and suddenly like, Oh shoot, they actually have talent. Who knew? Um, but, uh, <laughs> all, all of a sudden I don't the five-star will. players start playing like five-star players. Yeah. Well that, that they don't really have the, the, the exact talent that a lot of those other defenses do, but they certainly didn't have the coaching. You know, I want to allow one other, uh, at least a couple more voices up here. And I know I've let up Nate, Nate, you've been super patient. What's going on. Hey, how y'all doing? Um, Good. I, I want to talk to Nebraska, but I, if it's okay, I do want to add one last thing or my, my take on the Caleb Williams yeah, sure. um, thing. Because um, I do think it is interesting, and I, I kind of understand where some of the conversation is going on. Um, personally, I would agree. I think he does have a little bit of the uh, – from the from the public eye, a little bit of the immaturity. And you can add on the uh, – it was it was the fingernail painting thing from last year. Um, it was It was smack talk. But I, I think at the end of the day, the way the NFL works, I'm a Texans fan. The whole Deshaun Watson thing that happened, uh, he, he now is, he's now in Cleveland with a guaranteed contract of a lot of money. I mean, and he's like the first round pick, like they're gonna they're gonna take him because he still has that skill uh, skill set as a great quarterback. Um, that's I think that's what's gonna be happening. So I think his draft stock is still good. For sure, yeah. I mean, there's there's character flaws and then there's really bad character flaws. But let's yeah. talk Nebraska. I mean, yeah, I'm okay. shocked they lost. I'm sure everyone's shocked they lost to Michigan State. I thought they were going to totally get the uh, – they were going to snag bowl eligibility. And I know we had someone, uh, Blake, in the uh, replies also say, you know, if Nebraska loses to Maryland, will they be bowl eligible? Well, I think there's a win out there. What do you think? Yeah, definitely. And I think the biggest thing for me is because uh, I have a good friend. He's a, he's a Nebraska fan, and, you know, it's 
you know, they lose those first two games of the season. And I think we're sitting here. It's like, Oh, it's just, you know, the last, the typical Nebraska we've seen these past couple of years. And personally, I don't watch a lot of big 10 West. Um, so I'm just kind of curious of what is the actual um, temperature for uh, Nebraska right now? Because my friend who's been very depressed these past couple of years, he's actually mentioned the fact that they're kind of on pace for their best year since 2017. Cause if they make a bowl game, yeah, that's, that'll be the first one since then. And, you know, they could end up eight and four, nine and four if they win a bowl game. So I, I think we kind of in the beginning were like, oh, it's just typical Nebraska again. But like I said, I don't really watch them. Are they actually improving and getting better as a team and a product? Yes, absolutely. I think that, first of all, you know, I think a lot of folks starting 0 and 2 the way they did, I was, I was actually in the press box for their, their first game at Minnesota. And that was a defensive battle. It wasn't really clear. Again, you're, it's a first week. You're not sure what teams you're even seeing at that point, especially when they're not, you know, top 25 teams and people have really been scouting. We're kind of watching it. And I was like, wow, are these, either these teams are really good at defense or one of these teams are just awful and we're watching them slap each other around. Kind of like Nebraska Northwestern opening last season in Ireland. It's like uh, Northwestern didn't even win another game and, uh, 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 you know, for the rest of the season. And Nebraska yeah. was also miserable, but, and then Colorado, Colorado had that flash in the pan opening to their season. So that was the next game. It was a rivalry game. And then watching that Colorado temporary rise, people just kind of stopped paying attention to Nebraska. And maybe that was what they needed because they got a couple of wins. Sure. They lost to Michigan, but Michigan is, you know, they, they're pretty strong. I mean, Nebraska is going to, but watching them kind of, again, beating the teams that you kind of should beat if you're going to climb up. I think that was the thing. Watching them then go through Illinois, Northwestern, Purdue. You know, not the top of the Big Ten by any stretch. But those are the teams you want to see Nebraska, especially in the first year of Matt Rule, start to do. And historically, they always like to say this, Matt Rule's first season is his worst at Temple, at Baylor, and then he starts building from there. And it kind of does a good job of building a team that's especially defensively minded. And that's something I know Nebraska fans like the black shirts tradition, all of that stuff. Um, so I think that's the consensus. And I think that's what made the Michigan state game such a shocker. Um, it wasn't, a, it wasn't like a blowout. It was a close game, but people thought that was going to be where they clinch it. I think they still came. Maryland as unfortunately we've been talking about has, has struggled quite a bit. Um, we've got November, Maryland, which is somehow even worse than October, Maryland. So that might be their opportunity. And with Wisconsin, I don't even know what to expect from Wisconsin. They, they are an absolute mystery right now. I, I'm not sure what sort of game we're going to get from there. I am actually really looking forward to the, the Iowa game because we're going to see a game with two good defenses, potentially. It's going to be like, that's the game where I'm hoping goes into OT 0-0. That would be the perfect, oh my gosh, I want to wish that into existence. Like, I want to <laughs> see Iowa and Nebraska have a regular season finale that is zero zero going into overtime. I think the world will like that will cause rumblings through the very core of the earth. Like people in <laughs> Australia and China are going to be like, why is the earth rumbling? What am I feeling? And it's going to be a zero zero end of regulation in that game. But <laughs> that that would be that would be something. But all right, yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's nice to hear that. And and I guess uh, you know another kind of follow up to the that you know kind of your response is how has their recruiting been as well and I'm also looking at their schedule right now for next year um some of the heavy hitters that they have they have they're at they're going to use uh to USC um they have Ohio State at Ohio State and then a big one they're hosting Rutgers so you know maybe a more tough schedule next year it'll be interesting to you know how that growth of that rule pans out you know, before before I answer that, Ronnie J, I know you wanted to jump in, but did you just hear that? Hosting <laughs> Rutgers is part of this, man. Did you, just, did you just hear that? I heard that. I was like, hell yeah. We're, just, we're like, oh, tough game, hosting Rutgers. I was about to say, Michigan State, I understand why everyone says like, oh, you know, it's it's like Michigan State. Like, are they really as bad right now as people think they are? I mean, like, they absolutely should have beat Rutgers. And so, I mean, what, they, then they would have two wins without Mel Tucker. How many wins did Mel Tucker even have this year? Two. So they would have had just as many wins with him as without him. So I don't think they're, they're actually as bad as people think they are. Even yeah, they seem to be getting, his... getting their feet under them. It's not like they were completely lacking talent or anything like yeah. that. Exactly, yeah. And it's, it's sort of like with Northwestern, he has put together a way better season. They were left for dead 
before this season. And suddenly, you know, they're, they're doing better than anyone expected. So yeah, I, I, I agree with that a hundred percent. Um, you know, and let me see here. I just wanted to going back to the Nebraska. Oh, go ahead. Did you want to add something? Cause I was going to ask the Nebraska, they're decent so far in their rankings. I, I, in their recruiting rankings, I, I'm a little more hesitant with that. I'm not a, I admit I'm by no means a specialist in there. They're, Currently, their overall rank is is thirty one on two two four seven with a composite ranking of twenty five. We'll see how that develops. Over, I'm sh- I I would be shocked if Rule isn't at least getting the type of players that he wants, especially on defense. So I'm very curious to see how they do next season and how they kind of develop out. But I have again, Rule. The reason so many people wanted Rule. I mean, you if you remember last season, that was like the big thing. Where is he going to go? Is he going to go to Nebraska? Is he going to go to Nebraska? It's just he has such a track record of building up programs. And I mean, think about it. I mean, at Temple, he started two and 10 at Baylor. He started one and 11. So starting, you know, within bowl, with bowl eligibility within reach in his first year at Nebraska, that's just tremendous. And part of it, just, again, I still can't believe how bad Scott Frost was there. I think that was the bigger shock is, you know, he was there for five seasons. So it's not like, I mean, to some extent it's like, Oh, is he using Scott Frost players? Like Scott Frost didn't know how to use Scott Frost players, you know? So I, I think again, it's just been remarkable to see what Matt rules done there. So if I'm a, if I'm a Nebraska fan, I think most of them feel at least somewhat positive about what's going on here. It isn't like, Oh crap season where, you know, what we're seeing at uh, Louisville this season with a new head coach or with, you know, last season with TCU, but it, it's certainly, it's certainly a positive move. For uh, for Nebraska and at least for that that tradition rich program, I'm kind of hoping to see them see them do better because it's fun to see. I like seeing Nebraska do well. I just historically I'm used to that. When I grew up watching football, it was Nebraska. You know, everyone was scared of them. Um, I still here. miss Bo Pelini. I still miss Bo Pelini. <laughs> Bo Pelini. Oh, bless him. He's a fun one. We actually I still can't believe we got him to have a conversation on a on a Twitter space. That was fun. Let's see here. Ski mask Smurfy. What's going on? I'm gonna try and get. To the two folks that are also waiting as well. Um, what's going on with you, Ski Mask Murphy? It's been a bit. Uh, yeah, yeah it, it has been a bit. I just first wanted to say people wishing for rent and Grinch on my team. Is it a stickle kind of evil that I, that's, that's just a level of evil that people shouldn't do? Come on. You're supposed to be nice to one of them. But the first thing I want to talk about is, um, I mean, it's sort of college football related, but apparently – a local high school team here in my area got sort of got exposed and bullied out of playing a game against Bishop Sycamore. Yes, that that Bishop Sycamore. And I just think it's pretty hilarious. I mean, it, it started uh, two weeks ago. And so it was sort of like the in-between area where we didn't speak on here. But I just thought that was a funny story to bring up because they were. Yes, they, I remember that they, was coming up. And I, they I, that, were going to play I'm just surprised Bishop Sycamore. They just like, oh, this is too much attention. We're going to go the other way. Yeah, I mean, they should have known better. Like, you knew you were going to draw the attention of everybody if you if you scheduled Bishop Sycamore, and they did, and they they got exactly what they asked for. Sadly enough, um, but or maybe you know, ironically enough. But what's going on, man? What what else is on your mind? Uh, I will say, the, well, two big things on my mind, um, both involving my alma mater. The first big thing seems to be that um, it seems like by the way the college football playoff is voting right now. It feels like that if we go out this week as Michigan and, and put a decent beat down on Penn state, it seems like honestly, if, if there's a close game played between us and Ohio state, both of us will make the college football playoff. I think that's a little thing that people may not be paying attention to in the rankings currently. It seems like they're just waiting because, you know, everyone said we haven't really played anyone this season, but the, the nobodies who we played, we played them how you would expect a team that's good to play a nobody. So that seems like something that's potentially going to happen and is going to upset a lot of people, given how good a lot of the schedules are currently. I just think in the end that may that could happen and a lot of people are going to be butthurt. You know, I I I I have been a fan of the idea. I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm a fan of the ultimate doomsday scenario, which is we get a situation where we get just two Big Ten teams and two SEC teams in the in the uh, playoff. Why do I like that doomsday scenario? Number one, I think I'm a little evil. Number two, I think it would really get people hyped for the 12 team playoff because then people are going to be like, "This is nonsense! I can't believe this is happening!" And people are going to be so hyped for the next season. But 
I think, you know, it's interesting the way you set that up because we're in a really awkward position right now because there's, there's seriously, there's eight, nine, ten. Gosh, there's, uh, there's easily, I'd say, 11 teams with a real theoretical shot. Three of them, I think they need a lot of help. The three that need a lot of help, Ole Miss, Penn State, Louisville. They're in this zone where if enough chaos happens, they could get in. They could get in, but I, they can't get in on their own. They, even if they win out, they can't get in on their own. But then you get the top, the, the five undefeated, the, you know, the three, under, the three one-loss teams that have a shot, Oregon, Texas, and Alabama, or if they win out, it's going to be hard. But I'm, there's some teams out there that have got me more concerned. Like, I, I agree. I think what would be more likely is if Michigan wins out and beats Ohio State, so Ohio State's only loss is to Michigan, I think they're going to both get in at that point because then it's going to be real problematic. The, the committee is absolutely in love with Ohio State's schedule. I mean, the fact that, you know, they, they, ta- they cited in week one, or I should say last week, the Notre Dame win, the win against Penn State. And then this year, to keep them again ahead of Georgia, they said, like, oh, and also they beat, you know, Rutgers. And, and they, they started pumping up Rutgers' defense. And with Georgia, and it's kind of funny because with Georgia, obviously, they're, they're doing they're, – they're finishing – their schedule's, you know, stronger towards the end. They're doing what they're supposed to do. They, they you know, with Mizzou, Mizzou gave them a heck of a game. And maybe – I'm actually wondering if Mizzou, in their loss, gave other teams kind of a pattern of how you can kind of attack – that Georgia defense a bit, um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how they, they, they play out. But I mean, but again, we're talking about Ohio state and Michigan. I think if Michigan goes through undefeated, they could set up Ohio state to also go to the playoff. I thought I'm going to see how they do against Penn state. I think everybody is, because this is the first real challenger they have. And it, I was thinking about it, you know, a lot today, actually, I was thinking, you know, James Franklin, Michigan needs a game and James Franklin really needs the game because James Franklin right now is desperate to prove that he can win a big game um, against a top opponent like that. Cause of the way, the way the team showed up against Ohio state, the defense certainly did. And that's going to be really exciting to watch. I think this weekend, the two D de- the, the Michigan defense and the Ohio state for me and the, uh, the, pardon me, the Penn state defense, but can drew Aller kind of get it going? Cause he, he even admitted he had a terrible game. And I wonder if he was just totally off when he played Ohio state and can he, can he turn it on? And he seems to have. I mean, they had that really weird game with Indiana where Indiana, I never realized, Indiana had never won at Penn State. They were going for that. They came so damn close to it. And they fell short. And then we see Indiana kind of, pardon me, we see Penn State bounce back and just absolutely clobber Maryland. So, you know, is that it? Are we going to see, again, has Drew Aller start, he started to chuck it deep. Is that what they were waiting for all this time? For those who may not be familiar, there was a press conference about three weeks ago where James Franklin got really annoyed with a reporter who was asking about why they aren't using the deep ball. He kept asking for clarification. Finally, the reporter said, well, why don't you guys just chuck it deep? And that's how it got quoted, but that's not how the reporter originally started the, the question. Um, and he was not happy with that. But now here they are chucking it deep, and they look a little bit better. But I think Michigan still got an edge there. I think it's – we're good. They, or, and if Michigan's going to win, it's going to be all about J.J. McCarthy. Can he, can he really step up and, and – uh, and lead the lead that team in a in a high profile game because those are the moments where where you get that chance. Sorry, I'm kind of rambling here, but this I've been thinking a lot about this Michigan Penn State game because there's a lot that we're going to see, especially about whether and how Michigan does against a stronger program. Oh, sorry, did I leave you. <laughs> I, I should have asked you. So, um, but what are your thoughts yeah, going on that? Uh, my thought was going into all of these games is that it's. I don't know. It's, it's weird. We just haven't played anyone tough enough to to make me feel like, okay, I'm pretty confident. But Penn State, the way they've been, they've rearranged the offense a little bit, has me a little worried. But I think we should win. I'm just hoping that we win at a good enough standard that, you know, if we lose the Ohio State, we can still sneak into the college football playoff on the back end, if that does happen. But also, I mean, there's tons of doomsday scenarios out there about what could happen and I mean, we already lost everyone's favorite doomsday scenario due to a fake fair catch. So, and anything's up on the board. Is, I mean, realistically, Texas, Alabama, and Oregon all have a path to get in there. So, I don't know. Absolutely. You know, I'm gonna. Looks like we also brought Nate up. It's been a little bit. Nate, how are you doing today? Bob, what's up, my man? Sorry, um, <laughs> been busy the past 
couple weeks and um I, it's like i always um check to get into the space and realize oh i missed it's on tuesday you know what am i doing so my apologies there um love your space and uh no it's just great to have great to have you now what's on your mind yeah man uh <laughs> big weekend dude this is a uh this is a big determining weekend for college football we all know i mean starts off early with the uh, Michigan Penn State game just listen to your recap and um information about it i think i think it could be a close game closer maybe than most think um I, the michigan headlines are you know taking over the whole college football uh conundrum you know like i i personally think there should be more to uh their uh ability to even be playing for the playoffs i think that there's enough out there now where you know, the Big Ten and NCAA should be uh, ruling uh, to some type of degree of um, questionability of whether they should even be in the top four. Um, I just think it's kind of crazy that it's not not being finalized or not being investigated better. Better is how I should, you know, phrase it. I just – it's it's wacky to me. I, we've never seen anything like it. So um, I just think it's really weird that they let them continue to, um, you know – jump in and be a part of the, Hey, you know, nothing's going on. You know, they're, they're right here at number three. And, you know, I just think that's really weird. Um, and, and then they, their excuse is, well, it's not our job to investigate. I get that, you know, and that's a fair comment, but at the same time, you know, what does that say about, well, if you're doing something different or shady or whatever, and you know, um, other teams are having to change their whole program like Purdue had to do this past weekend. And you saw the head coach walk straight by, didn't acknowledge Harbaugh at all. I think that's just bad for the sport in general. It, it says a lot about, um, man, we all, we all tune in on Saturdays. We're all college football fans. But if any of us, if any of us feel like somebody's doing something outside the scope of um, rules and regulations, well, I think there should be a quicker um, – a quicker way to figure out if it's real or not. I guess that's my point on that. But um, uh, I'll, and, you know, Bob, I listen to anything you have to say about that. But uh, I'll say this: the Georgia Ole Miss game. I think it's a dangerous game for Georgia. You know, uh, Georgia's obviously playing good ball. Uh, Ole Miss is playing good ball too. So you know, I'm always trying to be fair about it on spaces. But um, Jackson Dart is a stud. Um, their running back is really good. Judkins, they got three wide receivers, Wade and um, uh, the two other guys. I'm just drawing a blank, but they they have three solid wide receivers that have put up numbers. So I think the Ole Miss offense versus the Georgia DBs will be the story of the game. Carson Beck's doing well. Deshaun Edwards, you know, we, there's rumors that Bowers could potentially come into the game. That remains to be seen. Um but I'll say this, I think it's going to be closer than the spread saying it's like 10 minus 10 or whatever. I, I wouldn't even look at the spread on this game. I wouldn't bet on it. It's going to be a close game. It's in Athens, obviously, but um, Ole Miss is primed right now. They're playing their best ball, and I think that they're going to give us a really good game. It, this could be a, a fourth quarter game down to the wire um, because of Ole Miss's offense. And uh, our DBs have got to figure out how to stop it. And we got to get pressure. You know, like we have some key injuries. Uh, Jalen, Jalen Walker, you guys are going to see his name and hear his name a lot during that game. Um, he's stepping in for the JDJ injury with the hand. Uh, so Walker is definitely going to get uh, more snaps. So look for him to try to make some noise against Jackson Dart. But yeah, it's going to be a it's going to be a huge game. And again, as always, Bob, thanks for letting me talk, man. I love your space. Sorry I haven't been here in a while. No, man. Yeah, th and Nate, thank you. I'm going to I just want to touch on both of those in reverse order cuz I know Ski Mask Smurphy or uh the Michigan fan is currently up here will absolutely want to touch on the first part. But I first want to talk about the game with Ole Miss. I'm I'm looking forward to it. I personally at this point will give the edge to the dogs, but only because it's, and I was having this conversation with, uh, with Shehan over on the, the College Football Survivor Show. It feels like Ole Miss is the SEC's litmus test. You know, If you're an elite team, you can beat them. If you're not, they're going to give you a whole bunch of problems and probably beat you, just like LSU found out in that shootout. And heading into – because we saw what happened with Alabama. I, I still don't know what happened to that Ole Miss team. Well, and to be fair, Alabama looked at its absolute weakest. We had just watched them lose a game to Texas where they got out physical 
on the line. We just watched that USF game. And then suddenly they discover Jalen Milrose talents and, and especially against Mizzou. Probably not Mizzou, but especially last week we saw Alabama just figure out how to unleash him. But with setting aside Alabama, sorry. Um, with Ole Miss, now they actually, but they have looked stronger as the season's gone on. They've been able to fight back. You know, they've had come from behind. They've been able to come from behind and rally uh, with games with LSU, Auburn, and Texas A&M. Um, that Texas A&M defense is pretty solid. So it, it's been really interesting to watch them play. So I, I, I don't feel... I feel like they're a stronger team than what we saw heading into that Alabama game. But at the same time, I'm not sure they're the ones. I wouldn't be sh- I wouldn't be as shocked. I think Ole Miss, it's kind of interesting because Ole Miss is the team where it's like if they keep winning, then it, it becomes an interesting question if they could get into that playoff race. They're still not a complete laughing stock in terms of like their chances. There's teams where it's like, ha-ha, no, no chance. They're never going to get in. Ole Miss is still enough of in the conversation where you kind of have to respect that. And you're right. Jackson Dart, they got Trey Harris, Dayton Wade. I mean, Quinshawn Judkins is suddenly playing well again. I mean, he was, he wasn't, it's not like he was terrible, but now he's playing at a level as a running back that people saw last season that made everyone so impressed by him. And that, again, that gives Dart a lot more options when he can open up and, and spread that defense out and give that offense some more, some more opportunity. So, I'm curious to see. I'm really wondering how they're going to break down the film of what they saw with what Mizzou, what worked for Mizzou and what didn't work for Mizzou. Because that that is the biggest question for me. Like, because Mizzou gave Georgia a game. They really did. And I think in the end, both the coaching talent and just the raw athletic talent of, of the roster that Georgia's put together and, and the depth of that roster is what maybe kind of pulled them away. And Mizzou is good, but... That that's where you know years of of having Kirby Smart and building that program up has has sort of benefited the, the dogs in those kinds of situations, especially where they played it. But I'm looking forward to this Ole Miss game. This is going to be a heck of a game. Now I want to shift really quick gears back to the, the Michigan thing. I am I I the more I hear about it, I I do I'm personally okay. There's a lot of ways to interpret this. I still think to some extent. Connor Stallions, I don't know his whole life background, but I really do think it's just a guy who, it's so funny because last year we didn't have a show, last week we didn't have a show, so we couldn't really talk about it in depth. I, he just really does come off a little bit as a guy who's just a little bit too into his team, like a little bit bunny boilerish if there was an equivalent for the college football fan. But I do agree there had to been some extra help there. I don't understand, though, why you would put your name on all the reservations. There's so many things I just can't explain with it. And that's what makes it so fun. The stakes are low. We're still talking about sports. There's a lot more serious stuff going on out there in the world. But the things that also – the Big Ten's in a weird circumstance here because if you look at – if they're going to go after him, they're going to go after – it seems like the most plausible result is Harbaugh gets suspended for X number of games. I don't know how many games they would do it. That would be the thing I would not be shocked to hear, that they go into the Penn State game and he's not the coach and possibly all the way to the Ohio State game. I'm not sure. I think, oddly enough, Michigan is probably the best prepared team in the country for that circumstance because they opened the season with three games where he wasn't the head coach. Granted, they were tune-up games, um, but they gave, had a chance to try a couple of guys as interim head coach. So it seems like if any team could be ready for that, it would be Michigan. One thing that's impressed me about Michigan is their ability to keep, apparently keep all of this stuff isolated from focusing on playing the game. They Purdue, you know, they, he has Purdue scored more points than any other team pr- previously, but they certainly didn't come close to scoring enough. And that final score was in real garbage time. So it really had no purpose whatsoever. So Michigan, it looks like they're playing at a consistent level. But going back to the Big Ten, Tony Petiti, he's got... There, there are some worrying precedents that could be created if they handle this wrong. Because the, they're, if they punish him, it's going to be under the sportsmanship policy. The way the Big Ten sportsmanship policy is written is... I mean, I'm a lawyer by background. is so vague. The way it's, I'm going to read the part. This is what he would be, this is how they would punish him. The Big Ten Conference expects all contests involving a member institution to be conducted without compromise to any fundamental element of sportsmanship. Okay, that you could see how that might fit, but then they start to define it. Such fundamental elements include integrity of the competition, civility towards all, and respect, particularly towards opponents and officials. I can see how they would fit it in there. I can see that. The problem is, Okay, let's say I think there's no doubt that 
this stuff happened to some extent at Michigan. It's hard, even though Stallions and his statement said no one knew anything about it. Somebody had to know something about it to the point where if this were a negligence case, you'd be saying like either the person knew or should have known. And you can kind of say, OK, there's some liability. They're not guilt. That's criminal law, but liability there. Um, looking at what's going on here, somebody had to finally ask Connor Stallions, like, okay, where are you getting this stuff from, man? Like, or there's a certain point of willful ignorance that is, is stretching that a bit far. But the problem is the stuff, and I, and I get that why Michigan probably were the source of like, hey, look at this, you know, Michigan. I mean, apparently the, the other argument is it wasn't Michigan that gave this information on this Ohio State Rutgers giving Purdue information on the signs of Michigan. It was somebody else uh, supposedly within the Big Ten who wanted the uh, the Big Ten conference to be aware that this could be brought up. You know, who cares where it came up? The, the, addressing it, it's not nearly the level of what Michigan's being accused of. It's just not. But it brings an interesting question. So if you punish Michigan, however you do for doing this stuff, what do you do for all these other teams that have been doing stuff like this, you know, for years? And I, I, I can't remember who tweeted it, but somebody brought up that great Jerry Tarkanian quote. It's like, you know, if nine teams are cheating, the team that isn't cheating is the one that's in dead last. Uh, there's so many layers to this. I mean, I could, you could go into so much depth on it. There's so much that's being written about it, and we're not even to the end of it. We're still not entirely sure about where it's going to go. Um, but man, is it spiced up everything. I, I honestly, personally, the way I think the end result is going to be, at least for this season, because some of this stuff is going to probably drag out, um, <laughs> is we're going to see you know Harbaugh potentially suspended for a game or two, several games. And that will be it for this season. But I could be wrong. I could be wrong on that. Um, I want to let Ski Mask Smurphy get a reply in there. And then, Nate, I'll let you come in as well. And then I want to get to Pete and James, who are also being patient. But Ski Mask Smurphy, I know you wanted to add something here, probably on this specific topic. Yeah, well, I was fine with talking about the Mississippi-Georgia game, but we're here. But, um, yeah, this whole time-stealing scandal is just, we thought it was going to go one way, and now it's just snowballed completely out of control. It's like each week there's a new detail or conspiracy theory that comes out. It's like we, we have the video of him on the Central Michigan sideline, and then Central Michigan AD is saying, I have no idea how he got on the sideline. Then we're hearing about, oh, Connor Simon wrote up a whole document, like his whole game plan, how he's going to become Michigan's head coach. Then I'm seeing conspiracy theories, even from Ohio State fans, saying that they're trying to do this to Harbaugh because he wants players to get paid and they're, like, trying to get them out the way. And I'm just like, it's, it's all over the place. And each little detail gets more swirling and swirling. And I think the other thing is, like, um, how people sort of have, like, this – I want to say misguided, but, like, a, not the correct view, like, how the NCAA works. is like, even as a fan of Michigan, I want this to get handled, like, quickly and surely, but it's like the NCAA is in its own real separate entity. Like it's made up of like all the chancellors, vice presidents, presidents, athletic directors, like every school. And so like, that's why like these things take so long to happen, such as like the recruiting, the recruiting suspension that Harbaugh took this season for like something that happened like two, three seasons ago, but like officially isn't going to be handed down for the NCAA. So possibly next season or the season after that. And so it's like just one of those things where it's like to touch on um, John and Reese's point earlier, it was, it was also brought up in an article I read a few weeks ago where like some people inside of college football and like other college were proposing that, you know, there sort of needs to be a separate sort of organization for each sport. So like things like this can get handled very easily and like, you know, like respect for the group five, someone can handle that sort of like football rankings and like not the NCAA, and, like every college having to say so in it, but like a very specific group just handles it because this, this scandal is going to drag on for a very long time. And this switch is probably not going to happen until probably 2026 by the time everyone's forgotten about it. <laughs> yeah. When it gets, when we get a, either a W or an L column, you know, we actually see it. And it's funny too, because that's what, and I, and I, I, part of me is like, imagine becoming the president of a university like Santa Ono at, at Michigan. Um, and, and I know he, he's, he's not been a president before, but I imagine coming in and like, okay, this is what I got to defend for my university. And that's why they get, I mean, it is like being a president of a small little country in a lot of ways. But I mean, that's why he's basically like, let's do due process. Let's drag it out because he's just trying to make sure. And I get it. Cause if you're, 
it's so funny. You almost think of if you're a university president, it's like the wins and the losses are nice and everything, but what you really care is keeping your alumni hyped so that they'll donate money. Because that's the bottom line of a university president. He's just got to get money into the university. So I, I get why his angle on all this is like, all right, no, no, do due process is just like slow down, slow down, slow down, um, so that they can get through this season, potentially win, and uh, and get as far as they can, and then get some uh, the money in there. And who, I mean, I, I think to some extent, USC fans, yeah, you know, it's like okay, 2015, all right, NCA, you wanted to go in that direction, but you know, the title for a lot of fans will. That's the thought. A lot of over time, especially over the last, I'd say, however many years, I get a sense that a lot of Schools have accepted that, like, yeah, you might get some wins knocked off down the line, but in the end, it's how people felt in the moment that was the most important, at the very least in terms of especially loosening up the, uh, the wallets of donors in a lot of ways. Nate, I know you wanted to touch on that, and I know, Andrew, you wanted to add something, and then I'll, I'll bring up James. Yeah. Um, so are you thinking that it's more um, – Let's. how do you prove that Harbaugh was the orchestrator, meaning like – you know, he has his, mm. you know, so I, I appreciate you said that the, the lawyer in you, uh, quote unquote, um, it comes down to how, how do you prove that Harbaugh was the orchestrator, right? So yeah. there's all, yeah, I, I think that is the, the big question. And I think that's why well, we I'll, haven't. I have to just, I have to add something to this because there's a, tr- yeah. there's a trick the NCAA can use here because, and this is the funny thing. It's a rule that was created because of basketball um, for the most part. They have basically, and, and they, they I've, it's so funny because I'll hear a sports journalist who uses this, and I don't know how well they know it, but vicarious liability. What does that mean? That means if you have a company, um, or you know, if you have a company and the employees in the process of doing their job do something that accidentally hurts somebody, the company's liable for it. It's, it's been around forever. So the, the NCAA basically created strict liability uh, for head coaches for what goes on in their program. It originated from basketball scandals, like where a basketball head coach was like, oh, I didn't know my assistant coach was paying all those players, like blah, 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 like the stuff that is well-known and well-documented in basketball. Well, they created a rule that is, again, it's almost like what Tony Petiti's got to worry about with how they interpret the sportsmanship policy at the Big Ten. Like, if you interpret it really strong with Harbaugh, what do you do with a guy who does half as much or a third as much? Like, what do you do? How do you, how do you use that? So... With the NCAA, they created a, this this strict liability, making a coach vicariously liable for the actions of within them. So you could easily just say he didn't have to know; he should have known. It's that he should have known what's going on in his house. That would be the way the NCAA rules are written right now. That would be not a difficult thing to argue, and it would be within the rules of the NCAA. So, yeah, a coordinator, and that's the thing. Like some questions have been like, are they going to eventually toss a coordinator under the bus? Are they going to say like, oh, the coordinator ended up knowing about it, or a really good position coach knew about it? But at least in so far as whether or not Harbaugh knew about it, I don't know if he knew about it. I would be part of me wonders if he did. I, that would be one of the harder connections to make. But I could see more than a few people knowing about it, and just like, well, the more he doesn't know, the better kind of situation. That's why I asked the question the way I phrased it. You know, the orchestrator, you know, it's so much harder to prove. And you could even go as far as to say, like, mob, you know, the mob stuff through through the times that we've all witnessed. Like, how do you prove the, you know, the guy that was running the scheme, right? So I'm not, I'm not, again, I'm not trying to compare Harbaugh to the mob, if anybody thought that. I'm just saying, like, how do you, how do you pigeonhole the, the person that sent it out? So, I think once you watch the footage that's out there, you see Connor and where all he's traveled and you piece all the things together in central Michigan and Jim McElwain and the connections that Jim has with Michigan. He was a QB coach in 2018. Connor was on the staff in 2016 and you go through the whole rabbit hole and then you see them, you know, yelling plays and they're changing plays during the, you know, sidelines and all the stuff that's out there. We've all seen that, right? I, at least if you follow college football, you've seen it. So at, at this point, if you're investigating, I don't say you don't question it, uh, especially, you know, with all the tickets that were bought and the, the record that Michigan has, you know, done since the scandal started. And there there's so much smoke and so much fire. And, and you got people on ESPN and college football, SEC Nation and everywhere else. They're all talking about it. it's the number one, you know, story in, in college football. So it's not like I'm bringing up something like trying to pretend like I'm the one that's, you know, creating this fire. No, it's it's way beyond me. It's it's huge. It's the number one story in college football. And there's 
The reason they're talking about it is they've all seen the same video footage. They've all seen Connor doing what it is. And then he supposedly got fired and then he resigned. And then he writes this generic, you know, thing through his lawyer and, and at the very end wants to make sure that Jim Harbaugh wasn't involved. And it's just so generic. I mean, it's, it reads very simply that there was a cheating scandal involved with the coaching staff at Michigan to try to steal, um, you know, through the laws that the college football has already created. It's not like you're doing it during the games. They did it uh, and they traveled and they stole, which is illegal. And th th those are those are laws that are already plain as view. All you got to do is read through college football uh, bylaws and you'll see that that's true. It's not me saying it. Mm -hmm. That's that's the facts. So. There is smoke there. There is fire there. I just feel like at this point, Big Ten Commissioner Petiti is scared to um, go after it because you have to piece all those together. You got to almost have at this point in a you know courtroom, you know Harbaugh saying to Connor, "Hey, steal those signs." You know, like you know, and, until they have that or until they can say that they definitively have that, people are going to argue it until the end of time. You know, so I, I think that's where we're at. I definitely feel that Michigan, you know, they they were dirty. They stole signs. That's why Connor's no longer with the team, obviously. And um, now now they're they're banking on not talk. Dude, I don't know if you saw Harbaugh's conference, but it was the most awkward thing I've ever seen. The guy didn't even know how to answer questions. He he was literally looking for like an exit sign out of uh, behind the, you know. Standing there, it was it was super awkward yeah. because he knows yeah. he knows if the wrong or right answers are asked and questions are given, he he doesn't know what to say because he knows he's a part of the whole thing. I mean, it's just obvious, point blank. Yeah, you know, I just want to say before I, uh, before I forget, and I, I do want to. Um, I know uh, Andrew wanted to add something. The one one of the big positives of this is the already existing discussion about bringing college football into the modern universe as far as communications technology seems to now have been galvanized. Uh, the P5 coaches all seem to be completely for it. Um, and they, they were already planning this. So two things have happened. I mean, they were already planning to use uh, in the bowl games, the non-playoff bowl games. They are allowed, if they want, teams can use communication technology. It has to be agreed upon by the conferences and the teams within each bowl game. So we're going to hopefully see some of that it sounds like it may end up being um, rather helmets. They might more because there's a whole issue with the helmets and trying to figure out uh, whether or not it makes them liable for head injuries that, uh, by by using them rather than, you know, by <laughs> I'm about to use a lawyer term, adulterating by by changing the helmets. They may not be they might be busted out of warranty, in which case it might open up liability. So they may just use the wristbands that can send messages. But then the other thing um, that just came up. This last week, the NCAA has also approved that video tablets will be allowed on the sidelines as well. Things that are available in the NFL already. So that's going to those communication technologies are going to be now brought into the game. And it seems like for better or worse, this whole brouhaha with Michigan is, is pushing that into the forefront. And a lot of people are asking, like, why didn't we wait this long? Like, can we just sideline all this BS? Um, and let's just pretend like it never... I could totally almost see that because so many other programs are maybe to some extent minor guilty to a lot of these things. I could say, like, let's just pretend it never happened, you know, and we'll we'll punish Michigan a bit and we'll just move on. I, I'd be curious to see how much that happens. Um, and that... You know, that's that an it, and Bob, not to interrupt, but that's the part that's um, problematic, you know? Like, I think there is something to be said about, hey... Maybe maybe the rules should have should be a little bit broader, especially uh, the fact that you can, you know, people take signs during the games and yada yada. I mean, that's been broadcasted on Paul Feinbaum and other shows on ESPN. But the problem is, there's a definitive law, and I don't remember exact. Uh, there's probably people that could quote it or whatever, but it's already been brought out. You can't go to another school and scout another uh, program's, you know, play calls. That that is yeah. illegal, and that's the problem that we're. The funny thing with, is, right? by the way, I don't it's know if people paper. know the reason that the, the reason yeah. that rule came up was it's actually to help the the poorer teams. It was really funny. They actually said not every team can afford to do it, so that was why the rule was actually and, and credit to uh, uh, I read that I think Benini at the, the Athletic did all the digging. The reason that rule was ever created was actually simply to benefit like Akron. 
Um, no, no, sorry to pick out Akron. I always just they're kind of my go to. But the uh, I believe in you, Zips, one day. But um, yeah, you know, it would be really funny, though. That would be a funny punishment. It's like, OK, moving forward, everyone can use tablets on the sideline. Michigan, you have to use a 2010 Zune. Uh, Microsoft is over whatever Microsoft. That, that, that's what you. Everyone gets to use state of the art. You gotta, you gotta use these old zooms we found in a in a box in the back. That, that you gotta figure out all your plays using that. And uh, but in there, know, but or, as laughable as that is, there is a point to be made about this though. Imagine all the schools hiring, you know, assistants or people that aren't even really on the payroll. They're showing up to practices. They're scouting, and they're they're literally videotaping other schools and their plays and what they're doing in practice. Imagine if that's really like what the open air, you know, or if that rule wasn't in place. Imagine if that's what it was. Like every school would do that. I mean, you'd have like, you know, 25 schools all scouting a, a program, videoing, and then taking it back. And they're all talking about it. And they're like, well, you know, this is the play they do. And, the, and then everyone's thinking, well, we showed them what we got. Now we got to change it this week, kind of like what Purdue had to go through. You know, what a conundrum. Like, we're not watching it for that. We're watching college football because we want to watch plays be called, teams try to stop the play, and then teams try to forward, you know, the football. That's what we're yeah. talking about. So, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Andrew, I want to give you a chance to talk. I know Ski Max Murphy has a point. I'm going to let up James. I'm going to try to get to you, Ray. So, knowing us, we're both in the legal profession, you and me. Uh, we love our hypotheticals. So, I and I, I realize that we're running on a bit late, so maybe we can uh, circle back to this next week. But seeing kind of the duality of punishments, quote unquote, potential punishments uh, for JMU where they're not bull eligible, um, which uh, it's been addressed several times by JMU, uh, whoever's been advocating on their behalf that all this is doing is hurting the student athletes. On the other side of things, if we're talking about Michigan, where I'm presuming these kids had nothing to do with the sign with the sign stealing, how do you punish a program without hurting the kids in some way? If if that makes sense, I, I've certainly heard that argument. That's definitely one of those arguments that's been made into how things should be done. Um, and I think that's something that should be considered. You know, Ski Mess Murphy, I'll let you talk. And then, James, I know you're up here. I'm just going to yeah. just temporarily mute you, and then we'll get to you. So what's up, oh. Ski Mess Murphy? What did you want to add? Andrew, what you said about hurting the kids, I believe – well, it's always been out there because of the death penalty, but I believe that if they did punish Michigan somewhat severely, you have the immediate transfer rule, which, always, which almost always applies, so – they, those kids could just easily go to another team, but what hurts the program? And then to think Nate and Baba, you both were talking about it, like the actual rule. The rule was made in 94, and it wasn't just, you know, it didn't just say um, you can't go, you know, scout another team. It also explicitly said you cannot use elect electronic devices to record, which at that time probably was a camcorder. You can use electrical devices to record, and you also can't use electrical devices to communicate communicate with with your with your players as well. So, I mean, from everything we've seen, we've basically done it all at Michigan, and it's one of those things where it's just I know also back then when the poor schools to help them because the team, basically all the big schools were doing it, which is going around and scouting other teams from the practices, which. The weird thing is, like, when you look at the NFL rules, it's also when sort of the uh, Spygate rule came into play because basically it was happening at the big college programs and at the NFL. So they was like, hey, this is completely unfair. Just stop it. Absolutely. That's a great point. Let's yeah, see here. I want to I wanna keep us kind of moving through this. So, James, what's going on? I'm going to try to get to you, Ray and Blake. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I mean, I have a theory on some of the aspects of why um, – you know, how you could punish the coaches is that you do take away their wins 
while you also might, I mean, you take away the, their wins because in a lot of ways, if you do, especially since they've been, you know, since the, since they've been using all these signs to win and all this stuff, that you take away a lot of their wins. I mean, quite frankly, you kind of make Jim Arbroyle. Now, of course, people know the on the field results there, but you also make it. You make the you humiliate them in a lot of ways. I do think in a lot of ways. Michigan has kind of like a Teflon to their name, kind of like Kansas basketball does in a lot of ways. And I'm not trying to necessarily, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to make is that there is a old school kind of vibe within their basketball football program that Kansas has within their basketball program that kind of makes it a little, a lot uh, you know, it's it's the elites within the system that have a lot of money and all that stuff. But I will say in some ways, it might be able, you know, a lot of the boosters might want Jim Harbaugh gone because I don't think, I, I don't think they really want this kind of publicity sticking with their football program because I do think in a lot of ways they will try to get, they will try to look at the K-State coach or the KU coach as possible replacements or something like that. And I think that'll probably be the right move on their part to move on from Jim Harborough because of the amount of negative publicity that has been on this football program. So I, 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 well, I'm skeptical about that. I think if they keep winning, they'll keep some attention there. And I think of all the reasons to get kicked out of a program, this one's pretty mild. I mean, we've, I still couldn't believe, I think, and I think, I don't think Tony Petiti actually said this, but some people have associated from the, the conversation, I think with the, the coaches that was obviously not, was not publicized, but, but we heard rumors coming out of it that he called it one of the worst things ever happened to in college football i'm like oh whoa, 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 slow down <laughs> you know whoever's thinking that we've seen some horrific wow. scandals yeah. with players dying and, and you know uh, larry nasser and and what happened at penn state a decade ago and more i mean oh, yeah. we, we've well, seen some worse for, things but I, I agree sure. i i see what you're saying I, frankly i think what would be more plausible in my head is um is Harbaugh just saying, you know what? I'm just tired of this. You know, it's <laughs> just taking an NFL job where they yeah. where they don't care. And and I because yeah. especially especially depending on how this season goes. If they mm-hmm. imagine if you go and and Michigan wins out and and wins the championship, and at that point Harbaugh will have like proved himself. At that point, you know, I mean, yeah. or even if, even if they just even if they quote just make the playoffs three years in a row and let's say beat Ohio State again, like that might be enough. And then he just like, why would he even? I mean, at that point, I could see Harbaugh just saying, like, I'm going to take that next job and, and, and mm-hmm. see if I can prove myself in the NFL, kind of like what Pete Carroll did when he had that chance to leave. And when he's because I think some people say, like, oh, Pete Carroll left because of the sanctions coming. I don't think he was he expected it. I don't think anyone expected how bad they were going to be. I mean, I remember one of the jokes was the NCAA was going to be finger guns. You could tell when Pete Carroll wanted to leave because I, I still remember there was a press conference where, um, Oh my God, I forgot. Uh, yeah, Chavez was going to, was, uh, Mark Chavez was going to leave. And he announced he wasn't coming back. And you could just see, because I think Carol was hoping he was going to change his, his opinion at that last second, and he didn't. And you could just see in his eyes, like, all right, I'm done. <laughs> you know, I'm tired of trying to convince these kids to stay. I, I got to move on. And I wonder if we're going to get that kind of a moment with a hard bot. Like, like, I'm done. I'm ready to move on. And this is it. But I mean, don't get me wrong. I think he's committed this season. I don't think, I mean, at this point, he's, he's, He's focused enough, and, and it's so funny. I remember Nate talked about being awkward. He's just kind of awkward all the time in some of his press conferences. I think he just he's just gonna get them through, and he's just gonna kind of to push them in. But we'll see. I it's a great it's a great question, and uh, and it, and by the way, James, I know you're a Mizzou fan. It's even though you guys had yeah. that loss, that tough loss, it was a hell of a game. I mean, you Why? guys gave Georgia it all, and I, and I mean to the credit, the uh, the committee barely. I mean, compared to some of the other teams, barely moved Mizzou. You know, yeah. uh, well, I, I do think in a lot of ways, what gives me confidence going into the Tennessee game 
is that you look at the quarterback situation, and Tennessee's quarterback is not very good. Now, the rest of their team is pretty elite, but the quarterback situation and the wide receivers are significantly worse than last year's quarterback wide receivers at Tennessee. And I do think Missouri has a lot better quarterback wide receivers offensive line this year than they did last year. So I do think that in a lot of ways you, I don't think it'll be like the complete reversal, but I think it'll be something like a 14 point win that'll kind of look like a 40, maybe 45, 28 kind of win where it'll be kind of close in the first half, but then it'll kind of break out and then you'll kind of say, Oh, Missouri's a much better team than Tennessee. But, it, you know, if you look at the game as a whole, it'll be pretty close for the most part. Cause you know, Tennessee is a good football team. Don't get me wrong, but the way Missouri has been playing is similar in a lot of ways to the way, the way Tennessee played last year. And I do think that in some ways, maybe it's better in some ways because the coaching, I think, to me, seems probably better this or on this Missouri team than last year's Tennessee team. But I do think in a lot of ways it, it, the record will be similar. You know, the possibly an Orange Bowl could be a, in the cards for Missouri, which – you know, that, that would be super ironic because, you know, for years, you know, I remember after that 2007 season, I know KU fans were taunting us for that Orange Bowl. But that, that, that'll, be, that'll be ironic there in a lot of ways. You know, Missouri will have their, you know, their Orange Bowl. And who knows? Maybe they win. I don't know. Who knows? That, you that, know, you, you brought something up that that's, I think some fans may not be aware of. One of the big things for Mizzou is they they've been they've been it's been it's almost like they've been cursed with not getting into the big bowl you know I mean they got in the cotton bowl in 2007 so that was at least a big deal that was still a nice January bowl game but not quite it wasn't a BCS bowl at the time um and that that went to Kansas so they've been haunting that because that that 2000 season seven season pardon me which for all its chaos the the whole Mizzou Kansas thing was actually really entertaining because those two teams really had just just strong seasons, um, but that that is something Mizzou is kind of battling for, and I'm yeah. very curious to see how they respond with Tennessee because that is a bit of a letdown to lose yeah. to Georgia the way they did. I mean, some teams after they they give their all against you know in this case the reigning two time reigning national champs, they kind of take an exhale and they don't quite. But I I uh, I'm thinking Mizzou is going to be a good team, and I'm looking forward to that Tennessee game because this really does feel like the battle for the second tier of the, or the second place or however you want to put it in the conference, now, because, do you, you think, know, do you think if there, I mean, there could be a very strong possibility that like, let's say KU beats K state that do you think that could be a possibility that Missouri plays Kansas in a bowl game or the orange bowl for that matter, that would be a wild game there because I personally you know, I grew up, you know, watching the Missouri-Kansas, you know, rivalry in both football and basketball. And I know that, you know, Missouri plays Kansas in basketball and potentially those two teams could be really good this season for basketball. But do you think that there could be a possibility? Now, I don't think the Orange Bowl has any tie-ins with the Big 12 anymore, but... That could be a possibility. I mean, I don't think the Orange Bowl hasn't had any tie-ins with the Big 12 ever. I mean, I don't think they haven't had any or, or tie-ins with Kansas or, or Kansas, for that matter, since um, the Big 8. So I, I think that, you know, you're going back almost 30 years there. So that could be kind of interesting there if – those, if, if you have a possible matchup in the Orange Bowl between two, you know, old time conference rivals, there, I, I, you know, to be I mean, people would love that. With, I mean, Bulls would love yeah. that. People would love that. The TV ratings would be excellent for it. 
Yeah. Um, but it's still a lot of ifs there. So let let let's let the rest of the season play out. Yeah. I know. I know. Uh, I think both programs would be excited to see those win out. You know, I want to give uh, Nate. He wanted to add something, and I'll get to Ray as we slowly kind of head towards the point where I'd like to wrap up this this particular RCFB talk. But James, thank you for joining us. I really appreciate hearing from you, man. So Nate, what's on your mind? Yeah, man. Um, man, I'm trying to remember back where, where I was trying to, you know, draw my hand up, but I'll say this quickly. <laughs> that was a while ago. Um, the Mizzou game, great game. Cook is great. Uh, solid performance. Great, good, really solid quarterback. Um, uh, Luther Borden, Luther Burden is a, uh, solid wide receiver talent. Weiss, great, great wide receiver as well. So I thought it was a solid performance by Mizzou. Their defense is underrated. Um, yeah, played a good game. I, I, I knew Georgia was going to come out on top, confident, but um, Missouri has a, a solid team. So where they where they stand in terms of a bowl, I, I don't know. Um, but, that, you know, Cook is, the, Cook is the key part of that, that whole team. Once he leaves, I don't know what's going to go on in Missouri. But, um, yeah, the guy, is, the guy has given a lot to the program. And it's good to see a Missouri program step up in the SEC as well as uh, Missouri has. So I wanted to say that, um, man, I had another point that I wanted to make before we got into the Missouri talk. I really, that's kind of why I raised my hand. Well, I don't if you really remember, wanna... just put your hand up again, and I promise I'll get to you. Okay. I promise. I Thanks, buddy. Ray, Appreciate what's it. going on? You've been super patient, though. Ray, I want to give you a chance to, to join in right now. Yeah, just to circle back to Connor Stallion's talk. Um <laughs> I was wondering if any of y'all had read the news tonight, the latest in his saga about him owning a business with Blake Corum. Yes, I and saw that. And, the, and what does that matter? You know, I don't think it matters that much. I think it's kind of funny because Blake Corum's like, I don't know that guy. And, I, and part of me wonders, there's so many ways companies get structured and, and getting a share of it. So I could see how they both end up having. And, and that's a funny thing. This is like the legacy of NIL, right? So you have all these kids getting deals and being getting to, to stretch their brand and get the money that a lot of them have deserved. Some of them are super savvy about, and I forgot it was like the backup quarter. He ended up being the backup quarterback at UCLA last year. He was like the whiz kid at it. Like he had just forgotten about I mean, football. He was still on the team, but he was just like, uh, had an insane number of NIL deals. So he actually found his, his lot in life was actually being a business person. Um, but I think for a lot of these guys, it's like, hey, now you can get this deal, sign up for it. So I do wonder if he just ended up in, because it's like in Wyoming or something. Uh, I wonder if he just somehow ended up in some kind of an arrangement. Um, and then now he's hearing like, oh, man, you're dealing with Connor Stallions. And he's like, I, I, I have a deal with him. And um, I, I don't know the exact details. I don't know how many partners there are in whatever or shareholders there are in whatever organization. This is a lot of questions I'd want to ask. Because it could be like, you know, it, it's like Green Bay fans like, huh, I'm one of the owners of the team. And you kind of talk about the joke of what that actually constitutes to be a, an owner of the Green Bay Packers. But, um, you know, it, I, I've read it. It's been kind of funny. Uh, I haven't seen where it's gone quite yet, but it's certainly been amusing. Um, who appears because I mean, yeah, I'm looking at one of the, you know, Blake Horam who appears as a co-owner of a Wyoming based company with Connor Stallions, says he was unaware of that supposed partnership. And he had no business relationship with Stallions. This is, I love it. Now we're getting all these, these young college guys figuring out, and I'm sure it's going to be wrong, all, all college sports, because I mean, there's some great deals going on for, for people in other sports as well. But they're, they're learning about the complications of being in business um, and, and how you can suddenly find yourself. I'm actually waiting now for something even more hilarious, like not more hilarious, but more like dramatic, like some, you know, some Middle East tyrant is also apparently like a co-owner of a, you know, some minor organization with, you know, one of the star players in college football. And they're going to be like, wait, what? And have like a protester show up at a, a college football game about something that had not like the player had no idea. Um, we're going to get like a uh, they're going to learn of the real world of, of PR because in business, let me tell you, sometimes you might be dealing with you, you hear about somebody who's got like hundreds of millions of dollars and and more money than cents and is happy to invest. And then you find out like, oh, they're associated with with some scandal and you're like, Oh, you can't take that money. That that's a problem because it's going to create problems for the company because no one's going to want to deal with you. So college football players, they're not trained to do that. I mean, high, when you were in high school, did you learn this stuff? I certainly didn't. 
And now, and now you're on a college football team and these guys are throwing deals at you and you're like, I'd love to take some money from you. Thank you. But then you find out like, wait, what? So, I mean, it's Ray, sorry to kind of go in that big circle with it. But part of me, like when, when Blake Corb says, I don't know who this is and I had no idea who this guy was, I kind of believe him because that just, I think, especially with what we know about Connor Stallions and his obsession with kind of being a part of everything um, and wanting to be the next head coach and wanting to kind of build his rep um, and really kind of that, that 20 something coach who wants to prove, I mean, the fact that it sounds like he went to the Naval Academy and went into the armed services because he wanted to, uh, uh, he wanted to prove himself and, and develop skills that would be valuable to the Michigan program. Given all that obsession, I think it's as much him just wanting to say he was part of something with a Michigan player, uh, and a star Michigan player than, than really quorum had anything to do with that. Frankly, that's my thought on it. Will we hear that? Connor Stallions and J.J. McCarthy were in a business deal together selling arms to Iran. <laughs> well, as long as they're not vacuums, because I don't know if you saw that whole thing, because Washington, uh, the part of the Wall Street Journal, Lane Higgins, great reporter. We've had her as a guest on our uh, on our talks before. She had this great report where it turns out he got a whole thing with his HOA and then he tried to represent himself. But one of the things was it was because the HOA was upset that he was apparently doing a home business involved selling vacuums. And somebody was able to dig up the reviews of his sales of vacuums. And they were like, this vacuum is already dirty. This I was represented to be new. And, and you're just kind of like, well, he's not a good vacuum salesman. So. I don't know if I'd want to necessarily join him with any particular uh, with any particular business at this point. Yeah, or that's a good moment. He, I like that. He's uh, selling used vacuums. I mean, <laughs> pretty good salesmanship. Like, how does that even happen? Like, I just love that. Like, he is a story that keeps on giving. And and I mean, I I'd love to have a conversation with him about anything at this point. I think he would be he would be just an interesting person to just pick apart. I'm just curious at this point because again. In the end, the stakes are so low. We're literally talking about college football. We're talking about like stuff that, okay, yeah, there might be some punishments meted out. And um, again, they could be, they're warranted. But again, with all the things that are going on in the world, I would just like to talk to the guy and learn more about him because this stuff is just so weird and fascinating. And um, anyway, I'm going to leave it there because at this point, we've been going on for about an hour and 45 minutes, which is longer than we typically do. But it'd been a while. We didn't have, get a chance to do a show yet last week. It was Halloween. So I had the one-two punch of being a dad. And then actually I, I went to Vegas uh, that night. I was on a plane by the time the show was actually starting. Um, I actually went to the Sphere, which is really cool. I'm not a huge U2 fan, but I had an opportunity to see a concert there. I don't care what reason you go. If you like seeing crazy architecture, that Sphere, that indoor screen. First of all, the screens in that thing are 16K. I didn't even know you could have screens that were 16K. It is so realistic. I Honestly, my thought was strap a helmet cam to somebody in this college football national championship and sell tickets. See, it's 18,000 sell tickets so that you're kind of running around the, the stadium with them, because that is one of the most bonkers visuals I've literally ever seen. Cause I'd seen clips of it. Seeing in person is nuts. And if you don't want to spend the insane amounts of money to see the concert, go on an off night and they have like a video that takes advantage of the screen in its full capacity because I have never seen a screen that made me think I was outdoors. That's how bright the screen is. When they do an outdoor scene, you literally turn to your left or right, look at the edges of the audience, and it looks like suddenly the whole arena is outside. I've never seen that. So, again, I, I'm not being, trust me, I'm not being paid by the sphere. I wish they had. But, um, again, that was where I was last week, and I just wanted to, to, to mention that. And, and that's part of the reason why. It's always, I miss talking to all of you. I wanted to thank everyone who joined us up here. Wanted to thank Andrew, Nate, you know, Ray, Ski Mask, Smurphy, Nate, uh, Ronnie, everyone who came up. It's, it's always a pleasure to spend a Tuesday night talking college football, talking about what's happening. We're going to head into this next week. It's going to be exciting. There's action going on tonight and tomorrow night. I think the games have all wrapped up. So congratulations, Western Michigan, Ball State, and Ohio for winning your game tonight. But Plenty of games to go. I'm actually really looking forward to the uh, – we actually have a ranked midweek game, and we're going to get the chance to see Louisville play. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how Louisville on Thursday handles Virginia because Virginia is still Virginia, but, hey, you know, they, they've, they've managed to meet out at least one upset. So it's an opportunity to see how Louisville's looking. I think they're one of the most underrated teams out there only because – that pit game was a little weird. Jawar Jordan was injured. He only had a chance to play two downs, but they've only they've only allowed three points in the last two games, and they've looked absolutely stunning. So Louisville 
If things, I mean, granted, I don't think they're going to get into the playoff, but they are one of those teams where if things go wacky enough and they win out and they beat Florida State in the uh, the ACC title game, they might have that chance. So that's a reason to watch that game on Thursday, just to see what Louisville is all about. But I'm going to go ahead and start wrapping this up. Nate, you wanted to add one last thought? Yeah, one last thought. Um, Consider going to an hour and a half. I mean, the hour goes by so fast. There's more and more traction with people that have a lot of insight with uh, some – you know, various uh, comments about the the landscape of college football. I think an hour and a half, if you have that time, I think it'd be awesome. No, so for sure. And I, I have no problems with an hour and a half for the most part. And actually, frankly, even even when it goes longer. But at this point, I'm actually kind of running on fumes. So that's why I went around on one, one hour and 45. I'm like, oh, gosh, I got to start wrapping this up. But again, on behalf of all of us at RCFB, we thank all of you for joining us. My name is Bob Akhairi. This is RCFB Talk 164. Now I'm going to hang up and listen.